Hello, we're here live. That boy bent episode 2626. Shout out Clayton Gathers. I'm your host, Young Mantis. To my left, we got the big dog, the 63220 Siberian Husky from Indiana. Call him a cord. Man, you make that weirder every time. Before we get into our guests, our main presenting sponsor, Black Can Tickets. If you're in the Colorado area, or really any area, looking at some tickets for special events on a great discount, great prices, Black Can Tickets are the guys to be. Hit them up. Tell them Matt to send you. We'll give you a great deal. We'll get into it later in the show. Our guest right now, the host of For one half of the host of For the Culture podcast. We got Luke Dominant in the house. Luke, what is popping? What's going on, guys? Appreciate you having me on. A fun week with the draft and everything. Now coming on that boy Bent. Couldn't be more excited. Luke has been doing the For the Culture podcast with Jason Spears for a pretty long time now. I would, I, I honestly believe that they're one of the top two, and not two of the best Colts podcasts in the nation. They've got some competitors, but they have the best knowledge, the most authentic insight. There's no bullshit, no conservative shit. They tell it how they see it. They got a great YouTube channel. They got also on Apple and Spotify. So I thought they'd be a great person to have on to recap the draft picks this week. I appreciate that. Top two and not two. I I totally agree. Drake said it best. <laughs> Whatever song that was. Couldn't have said it better. So first pick, all you Colts fans out there, we had – Quiddy Pay from Michigan, who has an incredible story. It's been like all over ESPN all weekend. Shit's wild. Yeah, we couldn't be happier. Us as Colts fans and the Colts within the organization. And we were saying the week leading up, it was, well, you want to go a little further back, I would say about a month leading up. It was between him and Phillips. Phillips goes 18 to Miami. Phillips had like six concussions at UCLA. And we heard that the Colts actually peeled him off their board, at least as far as the first round went. So, if we got to 21 and pay was gone and there was rumors that Miami was interested at 18 in pay, if it got to the Colts pick, they were definitely trading back. And unless Phillips fell absurdly far to like mid to late second, which was never going to happen, it was pretty much pay or nobody at that 21 overall. Maybe you get Phillips later on, but then you're looking at pretty substantial drop off from either pay or Phillips on the field to the pass rushers that would have been there in the second round, their next pick, not till 54. If you trade back elite first, maybe a guy like Tryon. So it was all the chips in the middle of the table for Quiddy Pay at 21. That's the guy Ballard wanted. That's the guy Iberflus wanted. He falls to 21 right into our lap. So as far as the first round goes, could not be happier with the selection and obviously a huge need, a top two need on this team going into the draft. You could tell it was definitely a need because the second pick was the guy from Vanderbilt. Uh, Deo, oh, how did you say his last name? It's incredible. Some of these names are so hard to pronounce. And then you think you get it right, and you get 3,000 comments telling you that you mispronounced it. I was saying Obango, but then I heard that was incorrect. So o Diembo or something like that. Odiembo. Yeah, just call him Deo. Iberflus and Ballard, as far as I know, had him in their top five pass rushers on March 30th. I had a text. I had five names. We tweeted out those five names. He was tied for third. So you could say top four, and that's before they peel Phillips off the board because of the medical medical history at UCLA. So before he transferred to Miami and UCLA basically told him you can't play anymore because of all the concussions. So it's a pretty good reason to peel a guy off a board. So you can make the argument he was in the top three and he wasn't three. So you can make the argument he was in the top two when it came down to pass rushers, the Colts like, and if he doesn't tear his Achilles, He's probably an option for the Colts if he's not on the board at 21 to trade back with, let's say, I don't know, the Saints at 28, and they could have drafted Deo there. We end up having him on the board at 54, and the Colts walk away with two out of their top four options at edge after their first two picks, which is very unusual to see, especially because you usually see a run earlier on in drafts. The first edge rusher doesn't go off the board until 18, the second one at 21. And we get our favorite one out of the two at 21, which is great. But most years you see a guy like Jadavion Clowney go number one or Miles Garrett go number one. Usually you see the elite premier guy go in the top five, at least because it's so important. What's the most important position on the field is the quarterback. So what's second most important, either protecting the quarterback or getting after the quarterback. So you always see a run on tackles. You see a run on edge rushers and you see a run on quarterbacks in the top 10, not this year. So we got very fortunate with that, not only at 21, but again, at 54, where we get arguably two out of the Colts top four options. And again, if Dale doesn't get hurt, if he doesn't tear that Achilles, he's going much earlier 
then he ends up going, which is all the way to 54 with the Colts in the second round. Do you think so we put two defensive ends, we're going to let Justin Houston walk or wait until maybe Dale's back to full recovery? No, nah, I think Houston's probably gone. They wanted Autry back. Like going into the offseason, I know they wanted Autry back. He was their main priority on the yeah. line. The Titans just go a little bit too much, too far for Ballard. It looks like that's not as big of a deal now. See, if you bring Autry back, you probably don't make the Dale pick. You probably go tackle there in the second round, or you trade back, try to get a couple more picks, trade back and go tackle. But, yeah, they wanted Autry back. Then Muhammad was kind of like a fullback plan. They end up re-signing Muhammad. There was a couple other moves they made. Or some might not even make the roster, depending on where Deo is in August going into September. But the chances are he's not ready to start the season. So, yeah, I think Houston – I think they flirted with Houston going into the draft, not knowing which direction were they going to go. Were they going to come out of the draft with a starting tackle or were they going to come out with multiple pass rushers? It's a, you know, it turns out to be multiple pass rushers. So I think right now all the emphasis would be on finding a left tackle to start week one because I don't believe that guy's on the roster. But – yeah, I think Houston's days are numbered in Indy. Not that he's completely done. I think he has something left in the tank, but I think he struggled against the run last year. And I think the Colts got younger, and they're going to stick with the guys they got. Plus, you have Kamoko, who had surgery again this offseason. He was not 100% last year, so I think he'll be 100% this year. You have Ben Banigou, who took a big step back last year. We just didn't see him on the field. I think you'll see him get more playing time this year. So... I think that they have guys in-house that they like that are young that are going to see an increase of snaps this year. You bring back Muhammad, you draft two guys in the first two rounds. So, yeah, I think Houston's done. Why not a tackle in those first two? Obviously, I mean, if, if Hay is the guy in one, like why not a tackle in two? And is it just because of their philosophy, hey, let's take the best guy available or the best guy that we feel is available or any reason for that? That's a great question. I definitely think it's a little bit of both. Like going into the draft, there's a reason why they sign guys like Tevi and Davenport, guys who are backups at this point in their career along the offensive line, at least at the tackle positions. And you still have Will Holden coming back. So I think what it was going to the draft, we solidified the depth. So you don't have Anthony Costanzo's replacement, but you do have upgraded depth from last year with Chaz Green and LaRaven Clark. So you upgrade the guys who were behind Costanzo last year going into the draft. Like there's certain guys that are just not like Valdir who came, you know, we signed him late in the season last year. The reason he was a free agent that late into the season was because he wanted to be a starter. So there wasn't an option from the start. So he says, okay, I'm going to hold out. He holds all the way out until December. Costanzo Mm -hmm. goes down. He's not going to be there for the playoff run. Mm -hmm. So then we sign Valdir. When we release him or whatever happens when we get knocked out in Buffalo, all of a sudden Green Bay signs him. So it shows that he was on team's radar, but, and I'm sure a bunch of teams wanted to sign him as a backup. And I think you have the same thing right now. Like I think Peters from Kansas city, I think a bunch of teams would say, yeah, come, you know, we'll sign you of course as a backup as you recover from the Achilles injury, but he wants to sign as a starter. So he'll hold out. He doesn't need the money immediately. He's going to hold out and he's going to wait until a starting job opens up so I think the Colts kind of went into the draft they addressed edge depth they addressed tackle depth and they were going to basically see okay let's go into the draft and who are we going to get as a starter to start at tackle or start at edge so maybe you go into the draft and pays off the board and Phillips is off the board at 21 and then you trade back and try ons off the board and then you go into the second round and you just you're never able to get the edge rusher but you get multiple tackles well then maybe we do give justin houston a call okay let's bring in a guy who's able to start able to get after the quarterback he still had i think eight sacks last year so you know he has enough to at least buy you a year and get to 2022 and the next year you address that early in the draft or in free agency or whatever it might be so i think that was the thought process so i think at 21 it was a no-brainer phillips was their guy I think, honestly, if the Colts were drafting at 12, I think it would Phillips would have been the guy. Like, if you go whole draft and you take away quarterbacks, or even if you add quarterbacks, it probably would have been – or let's take away quarterbacks. It probably would have been Pitts, Sewell, and then maybe Pay. I mean, that's how high on the board he would have been. I think he would have been above probably all the wide receivers. And then you just have a generational tackle that they would have taken over him, a generational tight end that they po- possibly would have taken over him. And then I think it was Quiddy Pay. I think that's how high he was on the board. So then you get into the second round. Okay, you know, pays a no-brainer in the first round. You get into the second round at 54, and I think it boiled down to a little bit of best player available. And also, there are options out there for tackles to come in on one-year deals and start. So you look at next year, you're you're probably not going to have a first-round pick because of the trade 
for Carson Wentz. If you make the playoffs or he plays like 70% of the snaps, you're not going to get that first round pick or you're going to lose your first or second round pick. I think it's going to be a first round pick. So that's next year. Even if you have concerns, like a lot of Colt fans have concerns with Deo's medical, with the Achilles. He's not going to be ready till October, summer, saying November. You never know. It's an Achilles injury. So everybody heals differently. Some people will say, oh, he's going to be back in September. Some people are going to say November. But at the end of the day, none of us know. So with that question mark, let's say he's not ready at all this year, just for argument's sake, to play devil advocate. If he's 100% and he's ready to go in 2022 and the Colts don't have a first round pick next year, you could almost look at it because if he doesn't tear his Achilles, the Colts do have a first round grade on the talent on him at, on the field at Vanderbilt. They had a first round grade. So let's look at it from a standpoint going into next year. You don't have a first round pick in the second round. You're able to draft a franchise left tackle. And then that first round pick, because you're not going to see him this year will almost be Deo as next year's first round pick. So that's one way to look at it, just the way the Colts are kind of putting this together. And also when we saw, like, we all talk about the tackle position last year, because after Anthony Costanzo, there was nothing I left tackle, right? Because Green was awful and Clark was awful. But when we signed Valdir, who was, you know, he's a pro's pro, a veteran guy in this league. When he started games, he was pretty solid for the Colts. And Jonathan Taylor had his 250 yard rushing performance with Valdir at tackle. It was not Anthony Costanzo, which just go. And he's a guy who's still available right now till this day. So it just goes to show there are options out there. And I think if you take any like B level tackle and you put them next to Quentin Nelson, they automatically become a B plus, or you put a B plus next to Quentin Nelson. I think they automatically become an A minus, which, you know, so no matter who you're plugging in there, you're going to, put him next to Quinn Nelson, which doesn't make Chaz Green or Laraven Clark look that good because they were that bad playing next to him. So you could only imagine how bad they would be playing next to an average or below average guard, which we saw plenty of from 2012 up until I would say 2017. So I think that's the reason I know there were guys like going into going into day two on, on a Friday. I know there were guys like, um, like the guard, the tackle from Texas was very high on the Colts list. I think his name is Nick Cosme or something like that. He was very high on the Colts list. He went right before the Colts pick. There was a couple other tackles, but as far as I'm concerned, going into day two, the two names that I know the Colts really had circled on their board was Elijah Moore, the wide receiver out of Ole Miss. He was never making it to 54, but he was one of the top guys on their list. And then the other name that we've been talking about since March 30th was Deo. So, the fact that he made it to 54, even if you have a couple of those tackles that a lot of people thought the Colts might take, there's still a pretty good chance that the Colts are going Deo at 54 no matter what because they were in love with that player and he was best player available. So I think there's a couple different ways to look at that, but I think the main way to look at it is they're set right now. Because you re-signed Stewart last year. Buckner's on, you know, a, a massive contract. We signed him the day after we made the trade with San Francisco. So you have your two interior starting spots solidified. Hey, you're looking, you know, you draft him in the first round at 21. You expect him to be a starter for a decade in Indianapolis. You know, eight plus years at least, bare minimum. And then Deo, they see first round ability in him. So you can make the argument right now that Ballard sees from week one of 2022 up until at least – Let's say 2026, he sees his starting defensive line. So you have that solidified. You have the guard position. You have the center position. You have the right tackle position. So three out of five positions on the offensive line solidified as well for the next five plus, hopefully longer than that. So you go into next year, you draft your tackle at your left tackle in the second round. If you don't have a first round pick and then, you look at Deo as your first round pick in 2022, fully healthy, ready to go in 2022. I think that's the thought process there for Chris Ballard as he's putting the lines together and, you know, kind of filling out this roster. There was double or nothing really. Yep. And also not addressing tackle in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth rounds, or even the seventh round, because we're all looking at Will Fries as a guard right now, maybe right tackle if you need him to, but probably a guard and maybe the eventual successor to Mark Lewinsky, when you look at the fact that he doesn't take a tackle in those middle rounds, that's telling me he doesn't want to waste the pick. He doesn't want to waste the spot because he's already addressed the tackle depth. Bringing in Sam Tevy is a backup 
spot. Bringing in Davenport is the backup spot with more experience than Chaz Green and LaRaven Clark, but there's still that void. And he didn't want to just bring in a guy who is going to get cut or bring in a guy when you already brought in Sam Tebby and then you're going to cut Tebby. So he wanted to bring, he wanted to keep that spot open for a veteran tackle that he's going to sign as a one year plug and play guy at that spot. So I think that's at least, you know, that's what I believe to be and have heard to be what they're thinking about right now at tackle and the whole thought process there throughout the draft. What an incredible name, Wolf Ross. Yeah, I know. I was joking around on the podcast. Ryan Grigson used to ask guys or now in his new job after leaving the Colts and getting fired, Ryan Grigson asked guys if they would like fries with that. And Chris Ballard is drafting guys with the last name fries. Oh, it comes full circle. It comes full circle. Is he the guy from Penn state? Yep. Penn state. Okay. I would, I have a question. So take away pay Mm -hmm. and probably Dale based on the way you're talking. Who is your favorite pick that they that they got? Like, who is the guy that you feel the most excited about personally? Ooh, good question. Uh, Will Fries, honestly, is one of the one of the probably best values we've got in the draft. Jason, when he you know he grades out three hundred plus players, he does the whole thing. He had him in the fourth round. The fact that he was still around in the seventh round, just from a value standpoint, was pretty good. But Kylan Granson, the third round pick, tight end out of SMU, I would say he and I know that's the kind of like the cop-out answer it's not the first round pick it's not the second round pick we didn't have a third round pick it's the next pick in the fourth round but I just think that he was probably the the best pick out of the two edge rushers and believe it or not and I didn't have it this way personally I thought that the biggest need going into the draft offensively was tackle Frank Reich when he listed out his needs he put number one tight end number two tackle so he wanted an upgrade from Burton he got an upgrade from Burton he got probably a more Eric Ebron caliber guy from the athleticism there, you know, in the middle of the field, running those seam routes. He didn't really have that last year. Cox should be that guy, but he just hasn't been that guy. He's actually better at blocking and doing the things you wouldn't think that a converted basketball player would be good at doing for whatever reason. Yeah, Yeah, you know, you have you have Doyle coming back, you have Cox coming back. And then I think that Granson is going to be to be solid in that room. And then he's not going to have the attitude and all the other issues that you had with Ebron because although Ebron was very athletic and talented and do, did many great things in Indianapolis, we also saw the drops add up and we saw, you know, off the field locker room stuff. And then I believe, and a lot of, you know, you can believe whatever you want. I do believe he faked that injury with the ankle or at least played it up in 2019. So you get Granson in here. I think it'll be an upgrade over Trey Burton. Burton wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination last year, but he was just too similar to Doyle. Like you had too many of the same guy in the tight end room. You had a bunch of guys who were good block, like with Grant and you're not getting a great blocker right away, but you could teach him to block and you could develop him into a blocker. We already have that. So it's, you're getting a little bit more dynamic here with Kyle Granza. But I, you know, I like this draft. I saw Greg Doyle today and then you saw a lot of guys saying they didn't like this draft class. It was a subpar draft. I totally disagree. I like this class a lot. And why wouldn't you? Chris Ballard's been knocking these out of the park. Maybe not 17, but 18, 19, 20. Why would you not? It's the same thing with, with Grigson, even if you like the draft, you would have to be hesitant and be like, you know what? This draft probably won't be good because of the guy drafting. And up until this point, why should I be optimistic? Because he's given me nothing to be optimistic about. With Ballard, it's the complete opposite. If you say you hate a pick, everybody who said, oh, the Darius Leonard pick sucks, well, they're all eating their words right now. Last year, I was not a huge fan of the Jonathan Taylor pick. And I'll be the first to admit it. Dead wrong about the pick, right? Because Chris Ballard is pretty damn good at this whole drafting thing. Then getting Julian Blackman in the third round. So I'm a big fan of this class. Where are you at with with the receiving core? Like, how do you feel about that? Because personally, and I definitely don't have the knowledge you do, but it just I, I'm not I'm not loving it yet. Like, I'm not I'm not thrilled about where it's at yet. Yeah, I'm definitely not thrilled either. It was a bigger need than they made it out to be in the draft as was tackle. And then we, you know, I know, like we all know that they're going to do something about the starting tackle. Like right now, the starting tackle is not on this roster, in my opinion, the the left tackle, you know, obviously Braden Smith is your right tackle. Unless the only way the starting left tackle is on this roster is if they start playing musical chairs and move Smith or move Nelson to left tackle, which I don't see happening unless they really need to, or there's an injury or something like that down the road. Like we saw last year when they started moving guys around and Nelson played a little bit of left tackle before signing Valdir. But yeah, I'm not thrilled with the wide receiver position right now, but they didn't get worse. Like I saw Greg Doyle say today that they got worse at receiver. You can't get worse when you're bringing everybody back. And 
you would hope to get healthier next year. T.Y. is still battling injuries. Now you can make the argument he's getting older. He's in his 30s. I think he's 32 going on 33 or 31 going on 32. But either way, he's in his 30s now. So you can make the argument that, well, at this point in T.Y.'s career, being an undersized, you know, five foot ten wide receiver, that starting a season healthy or being healthy now doesn't, you know, you can't guarantee that, which is a good point and everything like that. And the same thing with Paris Campbell. You're getting Campbell back healthy, which is great. But I think he's played like seven NFL games and he's had five surgeries. So the way I almost view Paris Campbell going into the year is house money. I'm expecting him to never get on the field. That way, if he plays three games, I'm like, wow, we just, you know, stole three games of house money from uh, from Paris Campbell because up until this point he hasn't showed us his ability to be available on Sunday you hope that's not the case but that's just the cold hard reality of the situation it's like Bob Sanders Bob Sanders was a Hall of Fame talent on the field but it was just you had to be realistic with yourself and you almost had to expect him to not be out there and then every game he played was a game of house money so I kind of feel like that right now about Paris Campbell but I think the first four spots are solidified it's obviously T.Y. Pittman Paris and Pascal. And I like Pascal a lot, but he's not a flashy guy. He's not going to give you, you know, eight games of hundred plus yards. He's not going to catch double digit touchdowns. He's going to be a lunch pail guy, a good blocker, a good teammate, extremely durable. If you don't expect Paris Campbell to be out there, you expect 17 games in the regular season plus playoffs out of Pascal. So he's one of my favorite players on this team, but he's more of a lunch pail guy. I don't think other teams are worried about playing pascal on sunday the way they would be worried about playing paris campbell because he's a game changer we saw last year in september when campbell was on the field it was really a different offense so i think those four guys are safe that's not breaking news to anybody everybody knows those four guys are safe and then you get into guys like ashton doolin who is a special teams player you could see him make the roster based on his ability on special teams and this colt's teams as coaching staff and ballard they obviously care a great deal about a guy's contributions on special teams we saw george odom last year First team all pro is a special teamer. He's not really giving you anything at safety, but he's going to make this roster again because he's one of the best gunners in the National Football League. And then you're going to have Patman, who I think that they're very high on because the proof's kind of, you know, it's kind of there when you read in between the lines. Last year, the Michael Harris was called up multiple times and cut, called up multiple times and cut. He was playing on Sunday. He was lining up in the slot when T.Y. was out and Paris Campbell was out. And he kept getting called up. He would play. He would play well, and then he would get cut. Why was he getting cut? Because they weren't worried about losing him. They viewed him as a dime a dozen type player. Oh, there's a bunch of guys who are five foot nine and run four, four. And I could just grab them anywhere and just plug them in because there's so many, like that's kind of how they viewed him. But Patman who didn't dress, I don't think until week 16 or week 17 last year, he never even dressed. He was on the 53 man roster from August all the way up until right now he's still on the roster. And why did they not cut him? Because they were terrified of losing him. They drafted him late. They drafted him in the sixth round. They obviously liked a lot of things that he brought to the table physically. They just didn't feel like he was there yet ready to play on Sundays. And the need for big physical receivers wasn't as big as the need for slot, smaller, shifty wide receivers when T.Y. went down. When T.Y. was healthy, okay, goodbye, screw you to Michael Hack. We don't care about you. That's basically the way they felt, and they showed us. You know, they treated him like he was Walker. Remember Walker? They would cut him like seven times a week. And then they would bring him back and cut him and bring him back and cut him and bring him back until he went to the AFL or whatever, one of those C- XFL, one of those, and now he's on the Panthers. He was a, a fucking MVP for the XFL. I know. <laughs> he's an MVP for their seven-game season or whatever it was. But... After being with uh, Sam Darnold, the Panthers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and now he's a Sam Darnold. He's competing over there. Well, good for him. And it's kind of the same thing last year with the Michael Harris. But they never did that with Patman, which tells me that they like him a lot. And then yesterday they draft or Saturday or whatever day, the final day of the draft was they draft Michael Strawn. I think his last name is he's like six, five, two thirty something, two forty something, oh, the four, four, which is just an absurd size to speed combo, but he comes out of Charleston, which is a division two school. Nobody's ever heard of him. I sure as hell never heard of him before the draft, but he's six, five. He can high point the ball. He has all those physical attributes you would want, but he comes out of a division two school. And, you know, the Colts were able to find him. He works out at the West Virginia Pro Day. I think he's going to compete with Patman either for the last spot or they both beat out Doolin and they round out the wide receiver room. So I don't love the wide receiver room, but I'm definitely like, as far as most intriguing pick, I think it's the seventh rounder out of Charleston, Michael Strong, because you just don't know what you're going to get from him. If you completely whiff on the pick, who cares? It's a seventh round pick. It's 
you know, a glorified undrafted free agent, but you're able to get him in the building. You don't have to bid with other teams for him. You use a pick on him. So I'm excited to see what he's able to bring to the table in the preseason because he's just, you know, physically, he's like 6'5", 240, runs a 4'4". Like, you can't teach that. And he just happens to come out of a small school. But we've seen this before with Ballard, EJ Speed, Division Three, And then you also had Grover Stewart. Nobody knew who Grover Stewart was. Took him in the fifth round out of Albany State. Turns out to be one of the best value picks Chris Ballard's ever made in Indianapolis and the bright spot of the 2017 draft class. Because Hooker's gone, Wilson's gone. The best pick of that class has been to date, and actually he's one of only two guys left on the roster, has been Grover Stewart, the only guy left. Outside of him is Marlon Mack, who's coming off a torn Achilles and probably won't be here next year because that job has been taken over by Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, I, I had no idea Michael was 6'5 until you said it now. I mean, when I'm watching the draft, I kind of like I, – I rely on my phone to give me notifications after with the second or third round. I don't really go into detail. So that was a big shock to me right there, 6'5. Jesus Christ. Yeah, 6'5, and he runs a – I think he runs a 4'4. Four, four, so he's got like – Callum Johnson. Like Michael Harris speed, but he's like a foot and a half taller. Yeah, bro. Next, next Megatron. And then you could see them do with Patman what they're doing with Strong. Now you might think, okay, a seventh round receiver out of a Division II school, he's not going to make the roster. But then you also look at this roster and you say, well, Pascal was an undrafted free agent. So it is possible. Jack Doyle, two-time pro bowler, undrafted free agent at the tight end position. So it's definitely possible that he makes this. I think the Colts have like a 22 or 23 year streak where an undrafted guy has made the roster. I think that's breaks this year. I don't think that any of these guys we signed undrafted are going to make the roster because I just think there's too much depth everywhere. Last year we needed a kicker, which is a good opportunity for an undrafted guy to make a roster this year. I don't see it, but I don't see why the seventh round out of position. We're a little bit weak at right now. I don't see why the seventh rounder can't make this roster, especially when you look at what they did last year with Patman, you can see very similar things because the biggest knock on him right now is not even his fault. The biggest knock is the competition level. He didn't play great competition in college. And then you look at Patman, he played at a Pac-12 school. He played in practice last year. So he probably went up against Rock and he went up against Carey and he went up against Rhodes and, you know, NFL corners in practice. So he has all that experience. He was able to pick the brain of T.Y. Hilton. He's in the Frank Reich offense. So he has a leg up in all of those regards. But then again, both guys could end up making this roster. I think that's a possibility as well. But, yeah, 6'5". I guess, you know, they don't give you all of that. Like, when they get into the seventh round, sometimes even on these broadcasts, they completely skip over some of these guys, especially if they don't know. Like, they might not have even expect us. <laughs> might not have had him on his big board. So, by the time they get to that pick, they might be talking about somebody else's story, and they might completely skip a pick, like, uh, strong. But, yeah, 6'5". Does a guy like that ever get converted to a tight end? I don't think so. I think he's no. a receiver. Only because he's – He's built more like a like a Randy Moss than gotcha. I think Patman, if you were to convert one of the two, I think Patman would have more of like a tight end kind of frame. Gotcha. But, but also because he's he's kind of raw as a receiver. So I think he'd be even more like I think he'd be too raw if you put like, you know, if you tried to because then you would have to learn how to block. Like he's already a bad blocker as a receiver. So then gotcha. it was that much more important. Plus we drafted the tight end. I think the tight end room right now is set for the foreseeable well, Doyle's getting up there in age, but I think the tight end room at least is set for now. The wide receiver room is more of a need. So if you have a guy right now that could come in and take a year to develop and then be ready by next year, I think that would be more important at the wide receiver position. But Quick shout out to my trainer, Ryan Coleman. Now, Ryan Coleman is a personal trainer located in Robert, Indiana. You can find him at, at Ryan Cole Fitness. Tell him Manson sent you via DM, comment, whatever it may be, and you'll get two free personal training sessions from him on him. Well, really on me. So hit up Brad Cole Fitness, located in Broderick, Indiana. If you want to lose weight, gain weight, gain muscle, whatever it may be, he's a perfect guy to get your health and your mind in a better place. I think my biggest surprise, well, I, I'm interested to hear about Sean Davis, but I was surprised that we got Sam Ellinger from Texas. That was too. I didn't think they would go quarterback. One thing we put out, though, the other week, was that the Colts were interested in Alex Smith prior to his retirement. So – that did tell us that they weren't just going to hand Easton the job. And that's not Ballard's MO. Nobody just yeah. gets anything handed to them. Everything's about competition. So we did know that, that Alex Smith was an option. And if you're Eason, you're much happier that it's Ellinger, not Smith. Because I think Smith would have been much more difficult for him to beat out for the backup job. 
So now you're like, okay, I get a guy who's kind of on even footing with me because we're both, we're almost both rookies in a sense because neither of them has ever played an NFL game or even a preseason game. But you do have a guy who has a lot more college experience. So you have one guy who's made, I don't know, 35, 40 starts in college. You have another guy who didn't play a lot in college because of the injury at Georgia, then going to Washington, sitting at Washington, and last year going pro and then obviously taking a redshirt year last year in the NFL. But Easton has the leg up in terms of experience being able to pick the brain last year of Philip, uh, Philip Rivers and being a guy who the narrative was Easton's not a good leader. Well, you have a great leader in Philip Rivers. And also with all the issues we have with Jacoby as a quarterback, one issue we never had was him as a leader. Jacoby was a great leader. So you have two great professionals that show up to work. They do their job in those two guys in Rivers and Bursette. So I think that he had, a lot of great experience there, plus being able to see NFL defenses in practice definitely gives him an advantage. So that'll be a fun preseason training camp battle, the backup quarterback spot between a fourth round pick last year and a sixth round pick or a fifth round pick, fifth or sixth round pick this year in Ellinger. So that'll be definitely fun. And I was surprised they took a quarterback, but once you get to Ellinger with sixth round, once you get to the sixth, seventh round, anything could happen. Oh, really? anyone can. I think the uh, oh no, Sean Davis was round five. Yeah, uh, pick number five. Yeah, Sean do Davis. You, do you see now, two safeties both named Sean Davis? We signed a Sean Davis from Pittsburgh who spells right. it S E A N, and now we have S H A W N. So we have two Sean Davises that are both playing the same position. You know when they say like some coaches like want to like let's take numbers off the jerseys and just call it so guys have to learn each other's name. Well, two guys that need numbers on their jerseys are two safeties. They're two backup safeties because they have the same name. And Let's shit, bro, with the new rule change, they could be on number like eight or number five now. That's true, yeah. So you could put them far apart. You could give one guy a 40 and you give one guy an eight. Now, do you do you like the new rule change? Before I say that, it's funny because when I, I always play the Madden franchise leagues and like all the really good Madden players make their best player like single-digit numbers. So it's kind of ironic how now the rule just changes. I don't know if the EA Sports had a uh, – Worried with that, or just because players are sitting tired of all of like forty-five or like thirty-eight or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's fine. I know yeah, Brady, no. Tom Brady hated it. Oh, well, I, I think the oldies gonna hate it, but the new younger guys love it. Well, I think the quarterbacks are gonna hate it because, especially like Brady, he's such a dinosaur. He's so you like when he made that point about like a defensive end, a linebacker. I'm not sure where like guys are lining up. People mock that. Like, oh, how are you not going to know that that guy's that? The way Brady reads defenses, and I bet Manning wouldn't have liked it either if he was still playing. They're so old school, and they're so set in their ways, being able to read a defense and call out the, you know, Mike, 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 and call out, you know, everything they do. He probably really genuinely is upset about it because everything with him is like process, process. How quick could I process? How quick could I figure out what they're doing? How quick could I identify the mic and all these things that we're not even – thinking about when we're watching a game because we're half drunk and we're you know we're just watching the game having fun doing what we do and these guys they're like computers the way they're reading the defense so I really genuinely think Brady had a problem with it now I don't have a problem with it as a fan unless it comes to a point where Wentz is throwing like eight interceptions a game because he can't read and identify the defense and it's not helping us on the other end because we're not able you know as long as it doesn't hurt us like that, I have I see no problem with it. I don't see any other problem with it besides that. So I think it's cool because you have a lot of guys in college and num- single digit numbers just look cooler, right? Like five, seven, like they're just cool looking numbers. One. So yeah, I think it's I think it's cool. Besides that, you know what to be a problem these days? Trying to find like tickets for events and concerts through you know scam ass websites. That's why our friends at Black Can Tickets are the best company to find tickets for any event. You know, my guy Kyle's been working there. Got to give him a call, man. He took up the website, blackcantages.com. So what they do, they plan, they even plan events and fundraisers, whatever you need for ticket sales operations. Kyle and I watch at the website, but they use them here soon. They're the best family owned and operate organization that works for you. Any ticket solution, ticket solution needs, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm on acting. It's a drug for act, acne. My lips or the side effects that it drives fucked. It is so hard to speak. Every time with the ad read, I don't know what it is. But the point is, you know it's not hard to read how good Black Can Tickets are. So check out the website. Hit up Kyle. His email's there. BlackCanTickets.com. The Ben boys use this. Might get a little special care package too if you say a man just sent you. 
and we're very happy to be partnering with them. My lips. Mine are too, and that never happens. I'm not on any medication, and it's not even cold out. It's, it's been like, I don't know, 65, 70 this week in Jersey, and for some reason, my lips were a little chapped. You've been speaking like, well, even though, you've been speaking on like 110% today. I'm surprised they are chapped. I don't, I don't, it probably doesn't affect my speaking, but it does. Oh, oh. It, it, they do. They are chapped. Like, I do, I have noticed that. Like, yesterday, I was like, that's weird. My lips are chapped because that never happens to me. And if it does happen, it would happen in like December. It wouldn't happen in April. No. What are we now? May? It wouldn't happen in May. Also, I think you got to, I think you got to ask him your question. You were telling me that. Austin's got a really interesting question for you, Luke. So I'm interested to hear that. Yeah, answer. man. I was here probably like one of the most underrated, obviously not employed by the Colts or anyone when it comes to uh, being the Colts insider. How did you build up all your connections? Because you're saying earlier how you got a guy text you about this and that. Like, how do you how do you get oh. these guys? All the, how do you get all your credibility? I know a guy who was the ball boy for the Colts a couple of years ago, and he's got all the connections. So you know two Colts ball boys. Oh no, that was you. Oh. <laughs> No, nah, I just know one Colts ball boy. No, nah, just yeah, one. Yeah. I don't know. You just you kind of get into it. You get you know you get interviews and you start you talk to Colts PR and you start to build these relationships and connections and then one thing leads to another. I'm actually a little bit more curious how other people aren't like that live in Indianapolis that are at every press conference that are walking the hallways that have that should have more access than Jason and myself how we're beating them on these scoops. We've, you know, even that second round pick, the Deo pick, Jason tweeted the Deo pick five minutes before the Colts tweeted the pick or, or made the pick and anybody else put it on Twitter. I don't know how like hold, I don't, I'm not even knocking these guys, but like Holder and Bo, like Bowen worked for the Colts. Like how have these guys who have been in Indy for a decade working and walking the hallways and going to press conferences I don't know how their connections aren't better because the Colts are very good at keeping their lips sealed. But yeah, we got fortunate. We made a couple connections and we've been able this off season. It actually started last year, but we were like, let's hold it off. Like let's not enter that world. Let's just kind of stick with the podcast, do what we do. Then we went into the season and we got some pretty big stuff. Like we got some stuff that wasn't being announced for like days after it. And we built up the trust and like, you know, some things you could say this if you want, eh, and we chose not to say, it. and then there was other things like, for example, like there was, you know, well, HIPAA laws, like there's a lot of injury stuff. Like you just can't say at all, but like we, we had stuff like that. We knew about, uh, we knew of the very unfortunate situation with R Rigoberto Sanchez. We found that out on a Thursday, he played the game against the Titans on Sunday. Yeah. And then that came out at a Reich presser on Monday and I also think holding stuff like that, because I've always wondered myself, and obviously we're on the ground floor, we're doing the Colts right now, we have a couple good connections within the Colts, but I've always wondered, like, how does Adam Schefter start? Like, how did Aaron Warnjowski start with the NBA? And these guys where players or coaches or agents, and I always figured it was more of an agent thing, are texting them all this information and they're just putting it out. Like, how did they get to that point? Well, now I guess I kind of a little bit know but now I want to know on the other side, how is nobody else in Indianapolis? Not to say that nobody ever breaks a story and we've broken everything. You know, we broke some stuff. Other guys break some stuff. There was definitely some things like there was definitely a couple of things that we talked about this off season that was so clear cut dry told to us that other people were saying the opposite. And we knew they were wrong. Like Xavier Rhodes was the number one option in house the entire off season from jump to the day they re-signed him. And then we also put that out 30 minutes before you in Rappaport that they agreed to terms on a one-year deal with, um, with Xavier Rhodes. Then we got TJ Carey. But going into the offseason, the number one priority was Xavier Rhodes. And you had other guys on the beat in Indianapolis say that the chances are he's not going to be back. When we knew the whole time that was never going to be the case. But, yeah, I can't reveal the names. Otherwise, they're no longer yeah. sources. But, you know, you just – you build connections, you earn trust. You don't say too much. You only say what you were told you're allowed to say, if not a little bit less than you were allowed to say. And then uh, you hope it grows. And eventually I hope, you know, we could do two teams, three teams, four teams, maybe not for the podcast, but in terms of like the insider stuff, but it's also very stressful when it got to that pick 21 and Quiddy, like I was rooting like giants. Don't take them. Please don't take them. Please don't take them. Please don't take them. They don't take them. And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, Dear God, if they don't take him, like if the Colts don't take Quiddy Pay, when we literally said it's Quiddy Pay or nobody else, 
we had all our eggs in the basket of one player because that's what we were told. So that's what we reported. But when we said that, it was literally one player or the field. And, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough that it happened and we got the guy. But it's fun. It's fun. It's great when you get it right. It's like gambling, oh, yeah. like a super high, high when you're right about something. But yeah, I never thought I'd be in that in that space. I always thought it was like podcasting, radio, work in radio, do my podcast on the side, eventually go full time into radio on air and stuff. Never expected to be a, an insider. But with the Colts, it's cool. It's fun. I do. I do enjoy it. Yeah, I remember. I remember testing you, man. I, I brought the news to you that Andrew was retiring before anyone else knew. I saw it was. No. Did you? No. <laughs> oh, I don't even. I blacked out the day Andrew Luck retired. I don't really remember anything of that day. So you you easily could have convinced me that you did. I that. cried. I cried that day. Oh, that was a tough day. There were some throat tears coming out. How does it work, like? Do they, like, if there's information, do they text you or do you have to just constantly be reaching out? Like, how does that work? It's both. It's both. You know, you don't want to overstep your boundary. And it's not like I'm not texting the Colts organization. Like, you know, it's not like yeah. the Colts have a PR guy and a, and a leak guy. So you make your connections through the organization. If, you know, I'm sure there's people in the organization that aren't happy about information being leaked. Not that we've leaked things that are like, like the, uh, for example, Kamoka Trey, we knew he needed surgery in August and we knew he was going to play the whole season with a ligament torn in his ankle. We weren't, you know, we weren't allowed to say anything. So we never said anything. Nobody ever breaks that. So I don't know, maybe Holder did know. And he was also told you're not allowed to break it. And then we get to a point where Ballard says it in his pre-draft press conference. And then, you know, now everybody knows. So now it's, you know, public knowledge because Ballard said it, but yeah, I think it just what was the exact question. The exact question was, I was just, I was just curious, like from your standpoint, like were you having to do most of the work on your end as far as like, Hey, oh, what's, what's the update here? Hey, what's the news here? Or is it more like they'll shoot you a text of like, Hey, Hey man, here's a little bit of info. And then it's up to you on how far to go with that. Like, yeah, a little bit of both. Cause you know, the relationships we formed, everybody's different. You know, we have multiple people we are in contact with. Some are more like friendly relationships and then some are more like, uh, you know, just strictly, hey, have you heard anything about blank? So kind of gotcha. depends on who I'm talking to. Pretty interesting, man. That's that's fascinating. I've always, like, because you think, he, like you were saying, a guy like Schefter, you're always like, does Schefter just have some guy you got drinks at the bar with like a week ago, like sending him some stuff? Or is he like, does he hounding it down? You never know. So Yeah, you always wonder how these guys start because it's such an interesting profession. Like, People grow up. Oh, I want to be on TV. Oh, I want to be on radio. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to be a coach. I want to be a player like the insider guy. Cause there's not many of them and most of them suck. And a lot of them are like piggyback reporters. So you have a lot of guys like that for like Yahoo and bleacher report. And some of the, you know, some of like the second tier, like good sites, like reputable sites, they'll be right about their stuff, but they're usually piggybacking an ESPN report. So like ESPN will report it. It'll probably be Schefter. And then all of a sudden somebody on Yahoo will say they had it, but Schefter had it first. Well, I could do that. I follow him. So two minutes after he tweets it, all I have to do is copy and paste the tweet and then say my source can confirm it, but he put it out first. So I, I think a lot of major publications have stuff like that. So there's only a couple of guys. And then like the best out of all of them is honestly not even sports related or sometimes they do sports related stuff, but it's TMZ. TMZ is insane with deaths and divorces. TMZ is fucking unreal. They had Kobe so fast. They know everything about everything. Like they had a, yeah. they were on top of the Kobe, you know, rest in peace and very upsetting, but like the, the whole helicopter crash, how they had that information but like there are family members that find out that their high profile family members have died from a tmz report like the tiger woods car crash tmz was on it before any of the sports related you know outlets were on it so i don't know how they do it but they are scary fast with their reporting and information but yeah in the sports world it's like that arian woge or whatever for the nba he lived in Glen Rock, New Jersey, which is probably about 15 minutes from where I live. He started at the Bergen record, which is the record in my county. I don't know where he went from the Bergen record up until the job at ESPN. I'm sure he had a lot of these guys as we've all had. I mean, Mantis, you've already done it with a bunch, you know, with 
barstool and networking and I've done it. And, you know, you, you get all these different little tiny jobs and you eventually, you know, keep pecking and pecking and pecking until you break through and you hit the big, you know, the big job. I don't know where ALT works, but I just remember him doing columns and he was doing high school stuff. He was doing columns in Burton County for the little Burton County Passaic County paper, which is like, I don't know, two counties in Jersey. I don't know how many counties we have 17 counties, two counties. And then he goes from that all of a sudden he becomes the top guy at ESPN. And then you have the other guy that also breaks stuff for the NBA, Blake and Shams. I think he's only 26 or 27 years old and he's been doing it for a couple of years. So I'm like, how do you get to that point so quickly? And then I also want to know maybe some guys, like if you take over for somebody, like when Woj is ready to retire, if somebody takes over for him, do they get like all of his sources? So maybe, maybe there's like hand-me-downs, but I think it starts with agents. So, and I think it starts at events. Like we did it through the podcast, talking to Colts PR, you know, Twitter connections and doing it from a distance, doing it from I'm in Jersey, Jason's in Maryland. But last year I went to the senior bowl and like Ian Rappaport was at the senior bowl and there's agents all over. Cause a lot of those guys haven't signed yet. So you have agents talking to players, trying to get them to sign with their agencies. So I think, I think it's a lot of networking. Like if you start networking with agents, they might tell you early and a lot of like, there's a couple of different things, ways you could go here, but I think like a lot of it's like, all right, an agent also might want a good relationship with a reporter. That way they could talk their guy up. Now we're not talking to any agents. I know agents, but we're not talking to agents. When we get our information, this is more cult related cult based stuff. I've heard things from more of a team perspective. And then I've also heard things that I'm like, that's completely false. And then I'm thinking, okay, this was probably told to this reporter by an agent because I know the way the team feels. I know the way the Colts feel about this player. I know the Colts did not talk to this player. And then you hear that this free agent, just pick a random guy. This free agent from the Carolina Panthers is linked to the Colts. No, the Colts have a lot of cap space. And that agent knows the Colts have a lot of cap space. And that agent is now reaching out to a buddy of his that worked for the charlotte chronicle that is going to put out that the colts have talked to x player and x player has mutual interest with the colts but i know that's not true so i've noticed a lot of that in the last couple months doing this where i'm like wow how much of this isn't true and if you think about the colts because we've had a lot of cap space the last couple of years think about every free agent being linked to the colts go back a couple of years the love on bell year bell was linked to the colts and Collins was was linked to the Colts and Brown was linked to the Colts and Bell was linked to the Colts. And all these guys were linked to the Colts and CJ Mosley was linked to the Colts. I don't think the Colts were interested in any of those guys. I don't know that because at the time I wasn't as involved, but it just goes to show that like, there's a lot of lying going on and a lot of misinformation. So it's very interesting. And then you also got to give a guy like Adam Schefter a ton of credit. He's so freaking accurate. You have a lot of other guys like Jason Lockafor or whatever his, like you have a lot of guys that just throw stuff at the wall and they might hit one out of 10. And then, yeah, I mean, I'm not even denying they know somebody like, yeah, they might know somebody and they might be telling you like everything they tell you, they might've heard, but who are they hearing it from? Are they hearing it from agents of players who are desperate to be signed? So they're going to this guy because with JJ Watt, we heard a lot of misinformation with the JJ Watt thing. Like somebody said that the Colts offered more money than the than the uh cardinals and it came from a cardinal reporter and i think i personally think that jj watt because i know the colts never went higher than than arizona they were much lower than arizona and that would make sense right when you look at ballard's history he's always been a low bidder in free agency so i know that was a lie but watt probably wanted to do a couple things one you know look as good as possible as far as oh everybody wanted me everybody wanted me and two People were saying, Arizona, why would he go to Arizona? I thought he wanted to win. Wouldn't he go to Green Bay if he wanted to win? Wouldn't he go to Tampa if he wanted to win? Wouldn't he go to, you know, even the Colts, a playoff team last year, if he wanted to win? Or Kansas City, of course. If you want to win, you're going to go to Kansas City and you're going to play with Patrick Mahomes. But he went to Arizona. Why would he go to a team that's almost in the later stages of a rebuild? Well, because he went because they offered him the most money. But when he gets there, and he, you know, and he forms a relationship with a beat guy or 
his agent forms a relationship with a beat guy. What are they going to do? They're going to tell him, well, you know, JJ actually had a better offer from the Indianapolis Colts than they think. Well, the Colts need an edge rusher. The Colts have more money to spend than anybody in free agency, except maybe one or two teams. Well, that makes sense. You know, and JJ Watts agent telling it to me. So he's not going to lie, but he probably did lie. And then I know somebody in the Colts who says that's a thousand percent inaccurate. So you definitely have a lot of lying and stuff go on like that. But as far as like confirmed info, Schefter's insane. Like he, he bats like, he bats like high nine hundreds when it comes to like, or as like far as confirmed stuff goes, he bats close to a thousand. It's like, fascinating. When pay was on the board, my heart was beeping, bump pumping. I was like, I mean, if they don't take them, I'm going to have to retire. Yeah. It's like gambling. <laughs> you lose, you lose and I hit that shot, man. You're, you're done. Yeah. The mega jackpot. Exactly. You know what? I'm still trying to hit a jackpot too. And that reminds me of a thing called Mania with Mantis. Now, Luke, I mean, I'm sure you've got a lot of pussy. Let's be straightforward to it. I mean, well, thank you. When you're the host of a of a Colts podcast, you know, that's the first thing that comes. I mean, you're racking up a lot more views than us, so I don't doubt it. Uh, we always ask our guests so you give some advice to me on how to mate with the girl, get to the point, chase a girl. I've chased a few girls here and there, but how do I how do I up my game? How do I get to the level of girls to level you're with? Covering the Colts. Well, the first thing would be don't cover the Colts. Pick a team in Los Angeles. Pick a team in Miami. Pick a team in, like, you know, on a beach. Uh, the second thing I would say is turn off the video for all three of us and let's go audio. Audio only will definitely help all of our cases when it comes <laughs> to picking up females. Right now, the video is on, and whoever has the big screen is probably doing the worst right now. So either go small box or turn off the video altogether. So I think those would be my two main words of advice. Or if you ever watch 90 Day Fiance, some of the most atrocious men in this country pick up babes overseas, like nines and tens, because they're so freaking desperate to get to this country. So when you're like, when you're really up against the wall, like Big Ed, you know what I'm talking about, Big Ed? Oh, uh, Big Ed's my cousin, yeah. Could you be a bigger loser than Big Ed? I mean, he gets girls, so probably not. Yeah, because he goes overseas. So he goes and he gets 50 Cent had a great tweet about it. And he goes, so he goes overseas and he gets like third world country girls and he brings them back over here. That's what they do on TLC. But that's like extreme desperation. So I don't think you'll ever get to that point. You're no, the bull- tender, loving, care for nothing. Just tell him you play for the Colts. You probably have pictures on the sideline. You might play for the Colts. Fuck it, yeah. You, you can tell the girls whatever you want, though, believe it. Austin, let's go pick you up a chicken like Tijuana. <laughs> I've heard that's a, a really good place to lose in Virginia. Yeah, that and uh, Amsterdam. Oh, yeah. The other thing is, I heard that Americans are more attractive overseas, too. That makes sense. Like, I had this one English teacher in high school, and he was bold, and he was fat, and he was, like, doughy and pale, and he was not, like, like the... For whatever hair he had left, it was like he had a little bit of red hair in the back. And he said he went overseas. And the women, if you maybe he was lying to me, he said the women were like falling all over him. And he was like, because I looked different and they liked it. It was like an exotic look. It was like, you know, it was like he just came off a spaceship and they were into it. And he said he did well over there. So oh, maybe spaceship. that's another. What do you think they'd think of Austin if he went over? <laughs> I think they would be like, well, damn, that boy Ben. That would give me the fucking alien sign with their hands. So just uh, pick a new team somewhere where girls go to. Turn, just try and cover my face with as many masks I can and just start spitting. Yeah. You heard well, it I'm... here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we, we appreciate that, dog. Well, I'm just saying, because like in like like Los Angeles, there's probably more attractive women in Los Angeles or Miami than maybe like somewhere Indiana, you know, yeah. in the middle of the country. Yeah. That makes sense. Absolutely. Or Dallas. Oh, anyway, you can't go wrong anywhere in Texas, really. They're all... Well, well, you know what it is. Me and Jason have a theory about the women in Dallas. They all migrate to Dallas to become Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. And then when they fail, they have to go work regular nine-to-five jobs. So there is an overabundance of attractive females in the Dallas area because everybody wants to be a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. And I think they trickle down to Houston because there was one point in time on Twitter where there was like, I don't know, like 10 or 12 Houston, Texas, Houston Texan cheerleaders that followed me on Twitter. And I was like, 
they're equal to equally if not more attractive than the dallas cowboy cheerleaders but they probably weren't good enough cheerleaders so they didn't make the team and then went down south to houston but yeah that's i think the reason why there's widespread hotness among chicks in texas because of the dallas cowboy cheerleaders that's why you're insiders i wouldn't have known that there you go just a theory there it is i'll tell you what dog you've done a lot of investigations a lot of just text messages thrown at you a lot of secret shit Mm-hmm. I'd be surprised from knowing me for so long. You can answer this. What does bet mean to you? I don't know, man. I was I was thinking about it all show. I don't know. There's many answers. I always think of you when I think of Ben. I think of Mantis. Yeah. That's, that's the right answer. That's, that's, that would be a correct answer. Just those multiple answers. As far as people go, I always think of Mantis. Yeah, it I is. Think of bull boys. I think of bull boys. I like that. When, if, you can't, if you can't think of an answer, it's just it's right in front of you. That's that's what it that's is. So damn true. It was right in front of me this whole time. <laughs> this whole show, I was staring right at the answer. There it and is. a great name for a podcast, may I add. That boy oh. Ben, I love it. Thank you. When I heard oh, you about this podcast, I was like, "Wow, this is gonna be a great podcast because the name is right off the bat. Even if people don't ever listen to it, they'll know that's a great name for a podcast." Like I feel the same way about for the culture. I think for the culture is such a dope name all these other cult podcasts are automatically off on the wrong foot because it's always something generic like Colts uncensored or Colts this or Colts that or Colts fourth and goal. Well, that, you know, that's stupid. It's, it's generic, bland. Yeah. That boy Ben is unique to you. Well said. Shit. There you go. Oh, and oh. also, I meant to tell you this. I don't think I ever commented on it. You put that video of the AAU coaches fighting the ref on Twitter and then the girl getting involved and throwing haymakers. Yes. Gold. That was absolute gold. Thank you. That, yeah, that, that video blew the fuck up. And that girl that had put, put in four rounds and the dude's fucking ripped. <laughs> <laughs> That's how these AAU tournaments are, though. These people are all nuts. Oh, yeah. Love it. I I absolutely live for it. I don't like AAU basketball. I, like, I don't think the actual brand of basketball is very good because I think it's a very isolated, like a lot of isolation, one-on-one basketball. They don't move the ball. They don't do a lot of the things that I like to see when I watch basketball. But as far as these parents and these coaches and the refs and even the kids to some extent, they're out of their freaking minds, and I love it. Oh, they're, it's, it's life or death games, really. Life or death. It's incredible. It's great oh. people watching. Oh, yeah. You guys got anything to add for Luke? No, sir. Luke, thank you for coming on, man. Your analysis was incredible. That was yeah. that was fun to listen to. So, um, oh, Thank you. Your questions your are fantastic as well. I appreciate both you guys for having me on. That boy, Ben, very, very thankful for the uh, for the opportunity. Check out For the Culture, not culture like me goes, culture, Apple, <laughs> Spotify, YouTube, subscribe to them if you can follow Luke at For the Culture on Twitter. Follow Jason Spears, the other half of the podcast. It, I think that's all the plugs right there. Yep, that's it. There it is. Boys and girls, you're a Colts fan. You'd love this. If you're not a Colts fan, hopefully you heard about the uh, May with Man part. Learn it there too about woman. <laughs> yep. That's it. All right, appreciate it, dog. See you soon. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Take care. See you, Luke. Hey, is that boy bet?